We're going to focus on a couple of verses here in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abashing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself as the truth of Christ is in me. No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Father, we do pray your blessing upon us tonight as we look in your word. Give us understanding and insight. May your spirit lead us and guide us into all the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to look back up to verse 3 where we read these words, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This is the second part of in the second part of the letter of Second Corinthians. Paul addresses a faction, a problem in this church that it was opposed to his apostleship, was opposed to his ministry um, among them, and they didn't want to listen to him. So Paul is writing this letter basically to tell them he is an apostle, and a letter that would be a vindication of his apostleship. And it was not a defense for his ministry. He's not defending what he has done and what he has taught. But what he is doing is he is answering this faction that has been levied against him. And what it is, is that we have Judaizers who are Jews that have followed Paul around and they've come into the churches that he has gone to and they've gotten with, <laughs> excuse me, the Jews that have come to Christ. They've gotten with the Gentiles who are there and they've said, Paul is leaving out some very important things. God sent the gospel to the Jews first. And so the Jews are God's chosen people. And if you're going to follow Christ, you must also practice the things of Judaism. And so they were trying to mix the gospel with works. They were trying to mix it with something else and take away their liberty. Paul writes in one place how they followed him to spy out his liberty that was in Christ. Not following Paul to see what he was doing, but following Paul so they could stop this teaching of grace and liberty that is given to the, through, through the gospel of Christ. 
So he had Gnostics that are coming, and Gnostics are coming along, and they are the people that have superior wisdom. They have secret knowledge from God. They have another word from God. They, they believe that, that the physical body doesn't matter, and you can do whatever you want in your body. And they believe that only God cares about your spirit, but they would also rely upon this secret knowledge they got from God. Now, we have people like that today, don't we? So Paul is afraid of something. And what he's afraid of is that these people will pull the church away from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. That they will so change the gospel into something that it's not. That they will take it away from the simple truth that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And they will take it away into something else that there's something we have to do. There are works that we have to also do. And Paul doesn't want that done. And he is telling them that just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, in verse 3, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so we see two words here in this verse. We see the word subtlety and we see the word simplicity. Satan's subtlety. And subtlety simply means craftiness, wickedness. And in other words, it is, it is, a, it is part of the tricks of Satan. That he will, he will come in and so confuse a person that they don't know what it is that they really believe. If you'll turn back to Genesis just for a few moments, and we'll come back to 2 Corinthians. But in Genesis <coughs> chapter 2... I want you to see in verse 16 and 17, and as Brother Doyle mentioned this, I think last week or sometime in the sermon, uh, if you will notice here in, in Genesis chapter 2, what takes place between Satan as the, as the serpent and Eve. And notice in verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now turn, if you would, just down to the next chapter, chapter 3. And look with me, beginning in verse 1, down through verse 6. And notice what it says here in verse 1 especially. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Well, as we learned from Brother Doyle last time when he mentioned this, that there was a questioning of God, okay? There was, there was this thing that by the serpent that you can't really trust God. You can't, you can't trust what God is saying. He's keeping something from you. He's hiding something from you. There was also this idea introduced into Eve's mind that she could determine what was good and evil. He said, you will know good and evil. You will know this. Because you have taken the fruit that God is keeping from you. God wants you to understand that if you eat of that, he said he'll, you'll die. But you're not going to die because God is also keeping this from you because he doesn't want you to be like he is. It's interesting when we talked about loving the world today and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You do see that very thing here in verse 6 that she saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise. 
But how was Eve to take of the tree? Only by disobeying God. The crafty wickedness of Satan basically says, you can take charge of your own life, you can be your own God, and God will have to honor that. God will have to bless you because then you will know what God knows. Well, here's the thing. Eve lost paradise over that, didn't she? They were thrown out of the garden. Paul's concern that just like Eve was deceived into thinking that there was a shortcut to knowledge, there was a shortcut to being able to determine what was right for her and what was wrong for her, that she would take charge of that, that she would in effect become her own God. How many religions offer that? Many of them do. You see, Satan hasn't really changed his tactics. Why? Because the desire of all of us is to rule our own lives. The desire of every person in this world is to say, I know what's best for me. You can't tell me anything. I decide what I will do. As one person said when at the garden, we developed a case of know-it-all-itis. We know what's best for us. We know what's best for everyone else. And many religions are based upon that. Many religions have the idea of someone with superior knowledge who has learned the secrets that no one else knows. And this is all part of the subtlety of Satan, of simply twisting things. You know, I want you to understand Satan knows more scripture than any of us. Do you know that? And remember, as I have said, we talked on Wednesday night, Satan is not this red little creature with horns and a tail. He is an angel of light that he has tried to transform himself into. He looks good. He sounds good. Listen, one of the great things that Satan does in many churches today, among many Christians, is that he tries to tell you as a Christian if you follow Jesus, there's nothing negative in that, in that walk. God only wants your happiness. He only wants you to have what you want. There's no need to repent. There's no need to change anything about yourself. One of the great lies of the enemy is that, is that God is not interested in changing you. He just loves you just as you are, and he, and he wants to keep loving you that way. Well, well, then why the cross? You see, if God loves us as we are, and we come as we are, and we just stay that way, what is the point of the cross? There's no point to the cross. It was foolishness of God to do that. But you see, we can't just come as we are. What does the Bible say? We come repenting. We come acknowledging our sin. And there are many people that say, well, you know, if we only talk about the need to repent and the need to get right with God, you know, where is the joy of the Christian life? It's in being right with God. You see, but Satan's subtle ways are basically this. God is holding out on you, and you've got to take matters in your own hands. What is it the Mormons teach? That... Christ atoned for our sins, but not all of our sins. We need to take matters in our own hands. We need to make atonement. Well, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's very clear. So Paul's great concern in 2 Corinthians 11 is that these Corinthian believers are going to be misled by the false teachers among them and it's going to take them away from the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. And now the question I have for all of us to think about is how often do we cover the plain, simple message of salvation? I've been amazed over the last several years at how the average Christian, and I would say even some Leaders in the church, pastors and others, have no clear idea about the gospel. Why is that? 
because of the subtlety of the enemy. The gospel message is very simple, but it's been covered over and confused with all kinds of things. We have, we have our doctrinal big words of soteriology and, and Calvinism and Arminianism, and people go, huh? And the limited atonement versus universal atonement, and all of these things are important in their place. And it's vital that we who desire to study to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that we understand as much of the scripture and the doctrines as we possibly can. But many, many times those doctrinal things interfere with the gospel of Christ. Because we're so set. Here's the average person that says, well, I believe that God saves only his elect, and so therefore only his elect will be saved. Well, then what's the point of witnessing for Christ? What's the point of going out and trying to lead a soul to Christ? He's going to save them anyway. Why do I need to do that? Well, here's the real thing. God does save his elect. God does call them to salvation, but he does it through the proclaiming of the gospel of Christ. He does it through the one-on-one -on -one communication that we have with others, awakening to their, to their need for Christ. It's all involved in that, but we do need to understand that the gospel message is not a complicated message. It's really simple. As a matter of fact, I want you just to look at 1 Corinthians 15. What is the gospel? Well, we've looked at this many times, but let's look at it in this context. 1 Corinthians 15, <coughs> verse 1. And let's see if you can understand what the gospel is. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Well, we know that. What are we going to hear about? The gospel. What is going to be declared to us in this passage? The gospel. He says, The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, <coughs> and then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, what is the gospel? It is the fact that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again, according to the, to the, to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. That's the good news. You see how simple it is? And yet man has made it so complicated. You see, when a man preaches the gospel, when anyone shares the gospel, what are they sharing? Well, our message is Jesus, just Jesus. That's it. It's not being a Baptist. It's not being a Methodist. It's not being anything else. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the very basis of our message in Matthew, and it's interesting that uh, the, the, the gospel is so simple that even a child can understand it. It's the adults that have problems with it. As we think, well, that's, that's too simple. It can't possibly be like that. Well, did you know that throughout the scripture, that whenever the Lord speaks of the gospel, or whenever anyone is really giving the essence of the gospel, it is, it is always given in one or two sentences. Do you realize that? It's not a long explanation. It's not like, well, back in eternity past, God looked down from the very foundations of his lofty throne, and he looked through all the eons of time, and he looked at everyone, and he had made his choices long before he even made anyone, and he sent someone to tell each of his elect. Huh? Let me show you what is said about the gospel. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. One sentence. Mark 1, 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. One sentence. 
John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, colon, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. One sentence. In John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Two sentences. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death to life one sentence Acts 16 30 and 31 talking about the Philippian jailer bringing Paul and Silas out and it says he brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house two sentences let me give you one more Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation two sentences here now I want to point out to you that is the very essence of the gospel it is not a complicated thing when someone would say to you hey how can I be saved what are you going to tell them? Well, I found this wonderful little gospel track. It has four steps in it. And I want to read them to you if you'll follow along as I read. Or we hand them a track that has print about that big. And it's filled with all kinds of things and all kinds of scriptures that have nothing to do with the gospel. And yet when Paul and Silas are brought out of the, of the jail, they are asked a simple question. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Well, but pastor, don't you understand that we must explain to them what believe means. You see, believe it's not just simply like believing something. It is really believing upon something. Do you think they really understand our explanation after we get done with that? People know what it is to believe. Trust me, they know. Now, I'm not saying we can't use illustrations. I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying let's not get away from the very simplicity of what the gospel is. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. There were no rocket scientists then, but it's not rocket science. And we don't have to have an, 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 an expanded degree somewhere that says, hey, he has a right to give the gospel. He understands all of the different words. You see, it's simple because we're simple. God wants us to be humble and rely upon what? His power. And that simple little message. And you say, well, they need to know that they must be saved. Certainly they do. But have you ever really, it's only been rare in my life that I've ever ran into somebody who honestly does not believe that they've ever done anything wrong in their lives. I remember talking Crossed the street many years ago to this house right over here, two-story house, and there was a group of cult group in there, uh, titled I think they were called the Friends Way of Self Realization, and they all wore robes and had long hair. They drove Volkswagen vans, and that's what I was attracted to them, and and so I would I would talk to them about that, and they had the guy uh, Bogwan who ran the group, and. Um, and he, uh, he lived there with a bunch of, of women and some two or three other guys. And, um, and one night, they said, would you like to come over and, and we could eat together and, and you, could, you could tell us what you believe. 
And I said, I'll be happy to. And so I took another guy with me, and we went over there. And we talked to them for well into two hours. And I want you to know that when, they, when his group began to ask me serious, earnest questions and began to listen and want follow-up questions, he cut the whole thing off. But I want to point out to you, one of the girls said, it can't be that simple. I said, well, why isn't it simple? She said, because our books tell us that we have to, we have to earn the ability to live in the eternal light. And I said, well, how do you earn it? She goes, well, we have to give our money to the Bhagwan, and we have to, to, to go to work, and we have to take care of the needs of the house, and we have to sell the materials that are here, and we have to do all these things, and if we don't, then we just come back as something else until we do it right. And I said, and yet Jesus said to the thief on the cross who hadn't done anything good in his life, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. I said, if it's all about Jesus, he does all the work. Well, I was never asked to come back. But I want to <laughs> point out to you, the gospel is not complicated. It's easy for us. It wasn't easy for Christ, was it? Look, if you would, do John's gospel, chapter 19, just for a moment. John's gospel, chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> John chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And Pilate therefore heard that saying, He was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. And then Pilate saith unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to to release thee. Drop down to verse 16 if you would. Verse 16 says, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, and where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Listen, it was not easy for Christ he paid everything, did he not? You see, the gospel is easy for us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But it was not easy for him. Salvation was not easy for God to accomplish because it meant the death of his only begotten son. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean, that he made him to be sin for us? Well, I heard one guy years ago that said, well, this phrase literally means that Jesus became every murder and every rape and every vile, wicked thing that people do. Well, no, that's not what it meant. You need to know your Old Testament a little bit and understand that Jesus as as the lamb, he was sacrificed for sin, but also he's taking the role of the scapegoat, that the sin was placed upon him, and he's sent away with it. Jesus became sin for us in that light, that he is the one who paid for sin as if he was responsible for it. But I want you to understand it had to be done so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. 
I want you to think about this because one of the hazards of being a Christian for a lengthy period of time is that we forget what we were saved from. We forget how we were. We forget our arrogance. We forget our wickedness. We forget all of those things and we never look at ourselves in that light again because we're so happy we're saved and we forgot what we were saved from. Oh, you should never forget that. doesn't mean you go back there and relive it, but you should never forget. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why Peter says that we don't grow and we don't become fruitful is because we have forgotten where we came from. Listen, if you begin to think about what your life was like before coming to Jesus Christ, you were not a good person. I don't care if you were good in the eyes of the world. You were not. I was not. I sometimes think of things that I was involved in and things that I did. And I sometimes say, Lord, why did you not kill me? Why did you not send me to hell? All I can figure out is because he loved me and he's merciful. There are things that were happened in my life that I did without even considering the consequence of anything. And God saved me out of that. And you can't forget that. Because he became sin for me so that I could be not just righteous, but I could be the righteousness of God. See, it's much more weighty. Is that a good phrase? Much more weighty. It's, it's weightier. Rather than just being righteous, to be the righteousness of God. Listen, what a wonderful thing this is. The act of conversion is a simple act, isn't it? Repent and believe the gospel. But the subtlety of Satan would have us do something, to cry, to have a feeling, to have some effort of our own. Yet the simplicity of Christ would simply have us believe on him. The invitation is simple, isn't it? Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a simple invitation, isn't it? If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, come. Well, don't I have to promise something for... No, come. It's almost like you're coming and carrying large packages, large bags of groceries or whatever it might be. And you're weary, you're heavy laden, you're carrying all these things in. Let's, let's even add more to it. It's pouring down rain. It's freezing. And you're carrying all these things in. Relating a little bit my own life a little bit. And carrying all of these things in. And what, to, what happens? Someone comes alongside and says, hey, let me take those for you. You see, that's what Jesus did. He invited us to come to him so he could take the load. Notice he doesn't say, come unto me. All you weary and heavy laden and I will help you. We'll work together on these things. No. Come to me with all of that load, with all of that heaviness, with all of that insecurity, with all of that doubt, with all of those questions. Come to me, Jesus said, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Simple invitation, isn't it? What about the even simpler invitation where he says, whosoever will may come. Well, could God save someone like me? Your name is whosoever, isn't it? Whosoever will may come. Well, don't I have to understand the difference between the elect and the non-elect? Whosoever will may come. Call to follow is simple. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, take his cross daily, and follow after me. It's a simple invitation, isn't it? It's a, it's a simple call. You want to follow me, Jesus says? Deny yourself. It's not about you any longer. 
You want to serve me as one of my followers? There's a cross there for you. Pick it up, carry it every day, and follow me. And yet at the same time, he is saying, take my load upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Listen, what is he saying? He's saying, if you take this yoke in Matthew 11 on you, then I am going to do what? I'm still going to make your burden light. Even the cross that we carry is light in comparison with what he did for us. Because the cross simply identifies us as belonging to Christ. I like what the old time preacher who's now with the Lord, Leonard Ravenhill, said many years ago. He said, when you saw someone in those days carrying a cross through the city, you knew they weren't coming back. And that's the same thing with you and I. If we're following Jesus Christ, it means what? We pick up the cross, we're not going back. We're not going back to the world. We're not going back to the life. We're following him. And he reminds us through this simple observance of the Lord's Supper. It's not a fancy observance, is it? I mean, we make it fancy. Our first century church had nothing like, you know, matching plates and little cups and things. They had nothing like that. We've done that for convenience over the years. But it was nothing about that. And it's not an observance that anybody can, can say, hey, look at me. Look at how I observe this. No, it's, it's a simple observance. You eat the bread. You drink the cup. You remember that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You remember that he came to be like us and tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. You learn and observe this wonderful truth that he took our sins and the payment and the punishment and the... <laughs> And all of, the, all of the, the embarrassment and humiliation of our sin upon himself. And that cup is simply representative of what? The blood. The blood that was shed that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. How long does it cleanse us for? Until the next observance of the Lord's Supper? Oh, no. Listen, many times we, we, we tend to want to look at somebody's life and and we tend to want to think, well, hey, you know what? They're not as good as, as I am and as good as they should be. Listen, if they know the Lord, they're as cleansed as you are. Think about that for a moment. They are just as clean as you are. I'm glad of that. And we remember that and we take of that. See, the simplicity of Christ is just keeping the focus on Jesus. That's it. One of the things that Eve could have told Satan if she was more aware of what was going on, she could have simply said, no, we can't do this. God just told us, don't eat of this tree, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Goodbye. And she could have done that, but she didn't do that. Why? Why? Because what he was saying appealed to her desire somewhere in there to do it her way. We human beings like to be noticed for what we've done, don't we? I remember a guy years ago in a first church I pastored that we were doing a scripture memory kind of, kind of thing and we trying to have a little contest, probably not a good thing for churches, but we were having a little contest to see if we could do this scripture memory booklet and and he went on beyond that. I mean, this guy, in the space of just, I think, about six months, learned well over 200 verses, and he could quote them just like that. And um, because I was a 19-year-old pastor, and I just was, you know, really hard, and I just, you know, he came in and told me, hey, pastor, I learned 200 verses. And I said, great, go learn some more. So he got his feelings hurt. So, Joe, you've never hurt anybody's feelings, because you're so kind. But, you know, I, I hurt this guy's feelings, and and I didn't really realize it. And, and when he told me, he goes, well, you know, 200 verses, don't you think that that's a lot? I said, yeah, it's a lot. So go try to learn some more. And he said, don't you appreciate what I've done? I said, well, who did you do it for? And so he stopped coming to church. 
And I had to go to him and say, what is, what's wrong? Well, Pastor, you know, you asked me to do that, and I did it. You could have at least, you know, told everybody, the church, that I did it. And I, I figured, well, you know, I didn't say this to him, but I, I was thinking, well, knowing you, it probably wouldn't take you very long to tell him. But I said, I'm sorry. You know what? I, I should have done that, and I don't know how to do this. So, you know, and so I came to the church. I said, I want you to know that, that, uh, that Matt here learned all these verses. And we're so grateful that God has given him a mind that he could do that. And then he told me, he goes, well, you know, in the back of the book of the scripture of memory, it says you're supposed to give me some kind of certificate. How come you're not going to do that? And right then, Brother Bob, I knew you can't win with some people. I want to point out to you, listen, it's not about getting attention for ourselves. It is about glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the simplicity in Christ. He has done everything. We have done nothing. You didn't do one thing to help in your salvation. Not one thing. Well, I believed. Yes, but he gave you the power to believe. You were made willing, the Bible says, in the day of his power. He drew you with cords of love, the Bible says, and drew you to himself. Isn't that so good? God has done it all. This is the simplicity that Paul is talking about. Why would we want to mess it up by trying to add works, by trying to add feelings, by trying to add an experience or two along the way to prove that somehow we have earned whatever God has? No, we haven't earned anything. When we take of this supper tonight, we're taking it in remembrance of what he did alone. And I think when we stand in his presence one day, first of all, I don't think we'll be standing long in his presence. I think our first inclination will be to to fall on our faces before God. Gone will be all of the desire to impress and, and tell him all that we've done. And how hard we had it on earth, but how faithful we were. Listen, God knows everything about you. Doesn't that scare you sometimes? God knows everything. And yet, it doesn't scare us because we know that he loves us. The simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. May we never lose it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us this time to just to look... <clears throat> at the simplicity of Christ. Lord, I pray that as we partake of this supper tonight, that you will honor yourself through it. Lord, that you will bring glory to your own name. Lord God, I do pray that as we remember your death, that we'll be mindful of that fact that you one day you're coming again And you're going to receive us to yourself, that where you are there, we will be also. So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time of supper tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our men will come to serve.
Thank you. 